Each time she visited the hospice, Ruby was painfully aware of the irreversible changes in her mother's condition, who was suffering from cancer. To provide her with care, pay for her housing and buy food, Ruby had to quit her college studies and get a job at a grocery store. At first, independent life was not easy, but with time, Ruby got used to it and learned a lot. But the thought that her mother would soon be gone and she would be all alone scared her, and Ruby decided to have her own family, no matter what it took. The naive girl imagined that she would have everything, like in those romantic movies she loved to watch. But in her surroundings, there were not such handsome and interesting guys, which were all her favorite movie characters. So, Ruby decided to find a guy through the internet and signed up on one of the dating sites. The picture of the pretty girl immediately attracted the attention of many young and even mature men, but none of them could really interest Ruby. Someone was rude, someone made vulgar jokes, and the well-mannered Ruby was repulsed by it. But one day, a man named Frank, who stood out from the others, wrote to her. He was romantic, a little shy, and, judging by the photo, a very handsome young man, slightly older than Ruby. He worked as a sales assistant, but in an appliance store, and seemed quite successful to Ruby. He was interesting, funny, easygoing, and very soon Frank invited her for a first date. Ruby could hardly wait for the end of her shift. She rushed out of the store, excited about the forthcoming meeting, and almost immediately noticed the boy and his faithful dog, Cooper. Tyler was eight years old. He used to live in an orphanage, but he was not good there, and the boy ran away. Ruby found out from Tyler that his mother died, and he never knew his grandparents and father. He never told where he slept. He was afraid of being reported to the police, and he was always on the alert. Used to living on the street, Tyler trusted almost no one, except Ruby, for whom he had a special affection. The young woman pitied the child and often fed him and gave him money, of which she herself had little. Tyler, hey, look what sweets I have for you, Ruby called to the boy. Wow, I love these, smiled Tyler, but you're so pleased not because of the candy, right? He added suspiciously. Hearing about the date, the boy somehow immediately soured. I know, you'll marry him and leave me, he said sadly. Well, no, that's never going to happen. She tried to cheer the boy up. Okay, I still have to go to my mum, and I'll see you again tomorrow, okay? Tyler nodded and with a heavy sigh, took Cooper in his arms and disappeared around the corner. Ruby spent half the evening with her mother and then she went to get ready for her date. She couldn't decide which dress to wear, and even called her best friend for help. Emma was the only one who had not abandoned Ruby in trouble, and she was always there to share both joy and pain. She was older than Ruby, and in contrast to Ruby, had no problems with money. Emma also had an explosive nature and a keen sense of justice. Having gone through all of Ruby's simple clothes... Emma went home and brought her friend a suitcase full of different outfits and shoes. As a result, the perfect match was found and Ruby went on a first date. Frank turned out to be as on his photos. He behaved gallantly and charmed Ruby even more. They joked and laughed a lot, though Frank didn't like the fact that Ruby worked as a salesman. Dirt you're a salesman too. The girl tried to object. Yes, but I work in a big retail store with the prospect of career advancement, and you don't have any opportunities for development. Ruby was unpleasant to hear this, but she was not offended. The girl was firmly convinced that she still had plenty of time to find an occupation to her liking and build a career, though how she would do it, Ruby had no idea yet. The young people began to date and Frank even offered Ruby to live together, though with the condition that first she had to leave the grocery store and find a better job. 
Ruby dreamed of being with her beloved, but could not figure out how to solve the problem of work, and it spoiled her mood. Oh, Tyler, she said to the homeless boy, treating him with sandwiches. Soon I'll quit here and won't be able to treat you. I'll be living with Frank soon and he doesn't want me to work here, she admitted. Maybe you could take me in, suggested Tyler hopefully. Well, you could say, I'm your little brother. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. I can barely make ends meet. My mother is sick. Better go back to the orphanage. Maybe they'll find you a normal family there. No one needs me, bitterly said Tyler and cried, and Cooper howled sadly, as if he felt his master's tragedy. Ruby watched this sad duet and also cried, holding the boy and his dog. Before she left, she promised that they would meet again tomorrow and she would bring something delicious for Tyler. But she couldn't. At that night, she was told that her mother was gone, and from this news, Ruby, as if she fell into an infinite abyss of pain from the loss of a loved one. Time passed, and Ruby, understanding that somehow it was necessary to go on living, tried to distract herself and spend more and more time in the merry company of Frank's friends. One day, they went to the river to swim, and the young people amused themselves by jumping into the water from a high precipice. Everyone jumped in, even Frank, but Ruby refused. Then Felicia, who hated Ruby for stealing Frank away from her, came up to her and began openly mocking her. Is that scary? She laughed. Well, I'll help you now, almost hissed the girl, and pushed Ruby down with terrible force. A minute later, the guys rushed after her and dragged her to the shore. Ruby could not move her legs. Panic ensued, an ambulance was called. That was how Ruby ended up in the hospital. Soon Frank was contacted by a doctor and reported that Ruby's spine was damaged. He asked him to come urgently, but he could not, explaining that he was on a business trip. The bedridden Ruby was stunned by such behaviour from Frank. Is he hiding from me? No, he's not. He can't betray. But then one day, the door of the ward swung open and Frank appeared on the threshold. Ruby rejoiced and a faint smile appeared on her pain-stricken face. Apologising for his long absence, Frank asked about her well-being. I'm all sore, Ruby replied in a weak voice. I hope that rehabilitation will help me, otherwise I don't know how to go on living. I'm so tired of being here. Please take me away, Frank, the girl begged. All right, I'll go to talk to the doctor and find out everything, he said after a long pause, and with a tight smile, he left the room. Forever. Emma was now the only support for Ruby. It was she who cared for her, bought expensive medicines, and paid for an apartment, so that Ruby had somewhere to go back to. She could not afford to pay for the expensive rehabilitation, but Emma promised to do something anyway. When Ruby was discharged from the hospital, Emma took a vacation and for the first time was living with Ruby, helping her in everything. But the vacation was over and Emma only came in the evenings. Hey, I think I found the best nurse in the world for you, declared Emma one day right from the doorstep. She moved aside and Tyler came out from behind her, hugging Cooper. Ruby was surprised, but at the same time pleased. I thought child labour was forbidden, Ruby said with a smile and hugged the boy. That's all right, it will be good for him, laughed Emma, better than begging on the street. Emma explained that she had once seen Ruby together with Tyler outside the grocery store, so she got the idea to find the boy and offer to live at Ruby's place. He agreed with pleasure. Tyler and his puppy were fed, and Emma also bought him new clothes. Tyler turned out to be conscientious and helped Ruby with everything. He did the cleaning, learned to cook, and was happy that now he had a home and his dog was always fed. Ruby felt good with them, but she was worried that Tyler had run away from the orphanage 
and she wanted the boy to study, but for the moment that was impossible. Ruby tried not to think about Frank, but she could not get her feelings for him out of her head. And then one day Emma, out of anger, told her the news that finally upset her. Can you believe it? I just got a call from my colleague. She's at Frank and Felicia's wedding right now. Yes, you're Frank. Scoundrel. While you're here in a wheelchair, he's having a great life. Is he marrying Felicia? whispered Ruby, pale. Yes, replied Emma. Do you know her? Of course, Ruby gritted through her teeth. She's the one who pushed me into the water that day. And then Emma's patience snapped. She resolutely directed the wheelchair with Ruby to the exit, not listening to any objections. The banquet hall was not far from Ruby's house, so they got there quickly. Emma, pushing the wheelchair with Ruby in front of her, literally burst into the beautifully decorated hall, just as the people were raising another glass to the young couple. Frank stood happily beside his beautiful bride, and Ruby felt her eyes tingle and her heart ached with resentment and disappointment. "'Why didn't you invite your previous sweetheart to your wedding, Frank?' yelled Emma. "'Have you no longer need for her? Are you aware that it was your Felicia who pushed her then and disabled her?' The guests fell silent, unsure of what to do next, and Frank grabbed Emma by the arm and dragged her toward the exit. "'Are you crazy?' he hissed in her ear. "'It's Ruby's own fault. She drank too much the other day, and that's why she jumped wrong and broke her spine.' "'What a wretch and a liar you are, Frank! Believe me, life will punish you for that!' shouted Emma. Frank shoved Emma out the door, and then his mother pushed the wheelchair with the sobbing Ruby out of the hall and declared that she would not allow her only son's wedding to be ruined. After that, they returned to the hall, and it was heard that the celebration continued as if nothing had happened. Emma, gasping with indignation, drove the sobbing Ruby away, promising revenge for the meanness and humiliation. But Ruby no longer wanted any revenge, and only dreamed of being home and forget all about it. But later that night, another shock awaited her. The doorbell rang unexpectedly, and Emma, who had decided to stay with her friend for the night, to support her after a hard day, did not want to open the door, knowing that at this time normal people do not go to guests. But the unexpected guest kept insistently ringing the doorbell, and Ruby, having decided that perhaps the neighbours had a problem, asked to open the door. Emma angrily opened it and froze. An elegantly dressed man, in his thirties, stood in front of her. He looked nothing like one of the neighbours, and certainly nothing like a hooligan, who had decided for fun to disturb the peace of the tenants. The man politely said hello, and informed them that his name was Matthew, and that he had come to pick up his son, Tyler. Ruby and Emma looked at each other incomprehensibly, and Tyler who looked out of the room at the noise, looked at the man carefully. Are you really my daddy? Aren't you lying? Really, the man smiled. I'm so glad to see you. If you let me come in, I'll explain everything. The girls escorted their guest into the kitchen, and he, over a cup of hot tea, told his story. As it turned out, Tyler's mother, Angela, was from a rich family. Matthew was a poor scientist at that time, so he was not suitable for the role of a son-in-law for Angela's parents. But Angela loved him, and she was going to marry him. Having quarrelled with her parents, she proudly left home and did not communicate with them any more. However, life with her beloved was too difficult for a girl accustomed to the luxury. Matthew worked in a factory, and all his ideas were rejected by junior managers and did not reach the top. Angela was disappointed, accused her husband of inaction, and persuaded him to give up science and get a better-paying job. During one of these quarrels, Matthew angrily gave her an ultimatum. 
Either she lives with him as before, or she can leave. But Angela was too proud, and that very evening she packed her things and left. A few days later, a delegation from Germany came to the factory, and Matthew was noticed and offered a job abroad. He was happy and immediately rushed to call Angela, but she did not answer. Matthew did not know where to look for her and went abroad alone. He often cursed himself for his intemperance and tried to call the girl, but nothing worked. As time went on, he was fully immersed in his work, confident that Angela had returned to her parents. During this time, he was able to achieve a lot, but his longing for his beloved did not let him rest. Eventually, he decided to seek her out, ask her forgiveness, and prove that he could be successful. After getting a lucrative contract in his homeland, Matthew returned and immediately began to look for Angela, and soon he found out that she had long been dead. But the big shock for Matthew was the news that Angela had not even told him about his son. Matthew began searching for the boy and found out that he was in an orphanage, but he ran away, and now they were looking for him. Then he engaged a private detective who brought him to Ruby. To prove his words, Matthew showed Angela's pictures, documents, and his own childhood photos. Ruby and Emma began to meticulously study the documents and photos. Although the boy looked so strikingly similar to Matthew as a child, that even without documents it was clear he was his real father. Tyler, seeing his mother's photo, cried quietly. Tyler, I would like you to live with me, Matthew appealed to his son. I have a spacious apartment, a TV on the wall, and a game console. No, answered the boy abruptly. I can't leave Ruby. But if you really have that much money, then help her get back on her feet, and then I'll move in with you. There was a tense silence in the kitchen for a moment, and then Emma smiled approvingly and winked at Tyler. Ruby tried to talk sense into Tyler and make him think about himself, but the boy stood his ground and firmly declared that he would never leave her. I recognize the character, just like his mother, said Matthew warmly and smiled. Matthew paid for Ruby's treatment, and during her rehabilitation, he communicated a lot with her, eager to get to know the person who meant so much to his son. Tyler, making sure his father kept his word, moved in to live with him and went to school. Matthew also got in touch with Angela's parents. They were insanely happy to meet their grandson, about whom they knew nothing. They had long since repented of everything and swore to themselves that they had lost their daughter because of their own pride. Matthew himself gradually realized that he had fallen in love with Ruby, this modest, kind girl who had gone through so much trouble. Unable to wait any longer, he took Tyler and Emma with him and went to see her at the rehabilitation centre, where the girl was already taking her first steps and proposed to her. Ruby was happy and without thinking twice said yes. After the wedding, they planned to move into a new house which needed to be furnished. Thus, in one of the shopping centres, Ruby unexpectedly saw Frank, of whom she had not thought for a long time. He still worked as a sales assistant, and when he saw a beautiful and well-dressed woman, at first he did not recognise her as his former beloved, who rushed to his wedding in the wheelchair. Frank stared at Ruby and her husband while they were shopping, but she did not even dignify him with a glance. When they got out and went to the car, he followed them for a long time, not understanding how Ruby had managed to get on her feet and become so rich. That day, Frank finally felt like a complete loser. Marriage to Felicia was a failure. She was frivolous, and she quickly lost interest in family life. He understood that he could not bring Ruby back and cursed himself for having so easily betrayed his love.